Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omahundro Institute. March 6, 1819. In the case of McCulloch versus Maryland, I, John Marshall, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States, shall read the majority opinion. In the case now to be determined, the defendant, a sovereign state, denies the obligation of a law enacted by the legislature of the Union, and the plaintiff, on his part, contests the validity of an act which has been passed by the legislature of that state. The Constitution of our country, in its most interesting and vital parts, is to be considered. The conflicting powers of the government of the Union and of its members, as marked in that Constitution, are to be discussed, and an opinion given which may essentially influence the great operations of the government. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 211 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Can a biography help us explore big historical questions? For example, can knowing more about the life of John Marshall, the fourth Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, help us better understand the Supreme Court and how it came to occupy the powerful place it has in the United States government? As we discovered in episode 209, the difference between a history and a biography often comes down to the author's goals. Histories tend to focus on large questions about change over time, while biographies tend to focus on the life of an individual or group of individuals. Today, we'll continue our exploration of biography and how it can help us explore and better understand the past with the third installment of the Omahundro Institute's Doing History biography series. In this third episode, we'll once again explore the life of John Marshall. This time, we'll explore his life with a scholar who used Marshall's story to explore a big historical question. Richard Brookheiser is a senior editor of National Review and the author of 13 books, most of them biographies. His latest book is a biography about John Marshall, titled John Marshall, The Man Who Made the Supreme Court. Now, as we converse and explore different aspects of Marshall's life, Richard reveals why he likes to research and write biographies, details about the stature of the Supreme Court in 1801, and information about two landmark Supreme Court cases, McCullough v. Maryland and Dartmouth College v. Woodward, and John Marshall's majority opinion in both of those cases. But first, don't forget to check out all of the great blog posts, bibliographies, and other resources we have for you in the OI Reader app. My Omahundro Institute Digital Projects team teammates, Joseph Edelman, Holly White, and Kim Foley, have been updating the app with each episode to provide you with new resources about biography. The OI Reader app is free and available for all Android and iOS devices. So visit your favorite app store or visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OIReader. All right, are you ready to see whether John Marshall's life can answer a big historical question about the Supreme Court and its powerful place in the United States government? Let's go meet our guest biographer. The first question made in the cause is, has Congress power to incorporate a bank? In discussing this question, the Council for the State of Maryland have deemed it of some importance in the construction of the Constitution to consider that instrument not as emanating from the people, but as the act of sovereign and independent states. The powers of the general government, it has been said, are delegated by the states, who alone are truly sovereign and must be exercised in subordination to the states, who alone possess supreme dominion it would be difficult to sustain this position. The convention which framed the Constitution was indeed elected by the state legislatures, but the instrument, when it came from their hands, was a mere proposal, without obligation or pretensions to it. It was reported to the then existing Congress of the United States with a request that it might be submitted to a convention of delegates, chosen in each state by the people thereof, under the recommendation of its legislature, for their assent and ratification. This mode of proceeding was adopted, 
and by the convention, by Congress, and by the state legislatures, the instrument was submitted to the people. They acted upon it in the only manner in which they can act safely, effectively, and wisely on such a subject, by assembling in convention. Joining us is a native of the Finger Lakes region of New York. He's a journalist with an expertise in politics and a historian of the founding era of the United States. He's a senior editor of National Review, and he's the author of 13 books, including Founder's Son, A Life of Abraham Lincoln, which you can hear all about in episode 68, and most recently, John Marshall, the man who made the Supreme Court. Welcome back to Ben Franklin's world, Richard Brookheiser. Thanks for having me. Now, Richard, I found something really curious when I was reviewing your work for our conversation today, and that's, of the 13 books you've written, most of them are biographies, and six are biographies about Federalists, Washington, Hamilton, John Adams, Governor Morris, and John Marshall. You've written just one biography about a Democratic Republican, James Madison. So would you tell us what you find so interesting and appealing about writing biographies and why you enjoy writing biographies of Federalists? Well, what I find appealing about biographies, it's what everybody finds appealing about them. They're the stories of lives. And we each have a life. We each have our own story. And we're always curious about other people's lives, other people's stories. How are they like us? How are they different? How did they deal with similar problems? How did they deal with very different problems, which nevertheless have similarities. I mean, it's a very old human interest, and I'm following in the footsteps of many, many writers and many more readers. As far as Federalists, my first biography was George Washington, and he became a Federalist at the end of his life. And from him, it was kind of a natural step to Alexander Hamilton, who was very active and partisan Federalist for as long as the party existed. So that's how I got into the Federalists. I think one thing that's interesting about them is that they were losers. You know, they did what they did, and then they made some very serious mistakes, and then they were gone. So I guess I have a nostalgic streak or a bit of a lost cause streak. So that made them interesting. You know, I have written about Madison. And that was a step across the aisle to the Democratic-Republican Party, or as I like to call it, the Republican Party. That seems to me that's what most members of it called it in its early days. You know, we avoid the label now because it might cause confusion with the GOP. But if I say Republican in the course of this conversation, I'm referring to the first Republican Party, which is Jefferson and Madison, the ancestors of today's Democratic Party. And so that forced me to see things from, you know, a different point of view, to really try to get in Madison's head and understand why he did what he did in resisting the Federalist Party and ultimately overthrowing and destroying it. Thomas Jefferson, I've never written about directly, although he appears in every one of the books. So in a way, I'm kind of doing his biography in pieces as I go along with everybody else. Now, biographies are the stories of lives. And yet, in your biography of John Marshall, you have this stated goal of exploring the question, should the Supreme Court be the sole arbiter of constitutional questions? And I'm curious why you chose to interrogate and investigate this question through a biography of Marshall and not through a legal history. Well, I couldn't do it as a legal history because, you know, I never went to law school and that's point one. And the second point is that I'm just not familiar with the entirety of U.S. legal history. I was going to have to bone up on a big enough swatch of it, you know, just to cover what happened in Marshall's lifetime. And to have pressed on into the late 19th and 20th centuries would have just been a voluminous task. And, you know, I think serious questions of this kind can be adequately addressed in the context of biographies. You know, maybe not resolved or solved, not that questions of this size perhaps can ever be adequately solved, but they can certainly be addressed because the people you're writing about addressed them. They grappled with them. They identified the questions 
and they had to take a stand one way or another. So telling the story of a life also tells you the story of what people were thinking about, what people were arguing about during that lifetime. So it sounds like Marshall served as a personal window, if you will, onto how to get an answer to a bigger historical question. Well, he was that, and he also, several things. He was a way of looking at the court and its role in the American system. Now, maybe that's the most important thing, because I believe he gave the court a kind of eminence that it now has and that it didn't really have until he came along. He was also interesting to me. We talked about how I'm a, you know, a kind of Latter-day Federalist. I guess I'm the last one. The party uh, disappeared in 1816. But John Marshall was really the last Federalist left standing, the last Federalist holding political office. He survives his own party by almost 20 years. He stays on the job until 1835. And in his mind, he is defending and carrying on the legacy of the man he most admired in the world, which was George Washington. And he is also expounding the legal philosophy of another man he greatly admired, Alexander Hamilton. His relationship to Hamilton was more of two peers. They were approximately the same age, equivalent in eminence. But Marshall said he called Washington that superior man. He called him the greatest man now living. And, you know, he had first encountered Washington in the Revolution when he was a captain and Washington was commander in chief. He saw him in action as a leader. That just became the model for him of what a leader should be, and also the model of a lot of his own later politics. And even though Washington dies in 1799 and Marshall survives him for 36 years, he sees himself in a way as being the last of Washington's soldiers in active service. You know, I'm curious about Marshall's politics, because as you mentioned, he basically does outwork and outlive his party by 20 years. I mean, he served as chief justice for 34 years between 1801 and 1835. And I'm curious about his political ideology because, as you mentioned, he saw himself as trying to see Washington and Hamilton's ideas for the nation into fruition. So why exactly did Marshall feel compelled to hold up Washington and Hamilton's vision for the nation? Well, the ground floor layer of Marshall's politics is his experience of the revolution. He serves in the revolution as a junior officer, a lieutenant finally promoted to being a captain. He's in the service, first in the Virginia militia, then in the Continental Army, from 1775 to 1781. He sees the army suffering. He was at Valley Forge. He lived with an army that was not being supplied with troops that were not being paid, officers that were not being paid, including Captain John Marshall. He saw what happens when a government cannot work or isn't working well. And this experience branded him, it branded a lot of other men, including George Washington and Alexander Hamilton. And they felt that the new nation would have to reform its political system, make it more effective and more responsible. And this effort culminates in the Constitutional Convention of 1787 and the new Constitution 14, 15 years after the revolution has ended. John Marshall plays a small but important role in that process. He's a delegate to the Virginia Ratifying Convention. He gives several important speeches on the floor, one of them on the new judiciary system, defending it from critics. And then after the Constitution is ratified, he becomes an active politician. This is one of his two careers. His daily job, if you will, is being a lawyer. That's how he's mostly earning the money that supports him and his family and the style of living to which he wants to be accustomed. But he's also active in politics. He's in Virginia politics. He ultimately is uh, told to run for Congress by George Washington in 1799. Washington is looking for young Federalists to serve in Virginia's congressional delegation. Marshall does that. He wins a seat in Congress. 
Then he's promoted from that to being Secretary of State by President John Adams. And then at the tail end of Adams's administration, Adams puts him on the Supreme Court as Chief Justice. So what policies was he upholding during those years? He was a Federalist in the sense that he wanted America to be strong in the world. He thought that we should not continue to ally ourselves with France after the French Revolution. They had been our ally during the Revolutionary War. He knew a lot of French officers. He was friendly with them, men like the Marquis de Lafayette. But he didn't want that gratitude to continue after the French had revolutionized and changed their own system. Their interests were not necessarily the same as ours. And he felt that the first Republican Party, led by Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, was simply compulsively pro-French. They thought the French Revolution was just great. They thought it could be an example to Republicans in the United States. They were willing to cut France all kinds of slack whenever France made requests or demands upon us, or whenever we fell into quarrels with France, they consistently took the side of France. Marshall thought that they were more patriotic towards France than they were towards the United States. And this was a great disappointment to him. It was really the source of his lifelong dislike of Thomas Jefferson, who was his cousin, second cousin once removed, and they hated each other. Marshall also came to feel that there was a tendency in American life to use the new political freedom and independence that we had as a means for repudiating one's obligations, one's debts, one's contracts. When we'd been a colony, we had to obey British laws. Ultimately, that was the check on what we might do. But now that we were independent, Marshall felt too many Americans were thinking, well, all right, let's rewrite the laws so debts don't have to be collected on time, or perhaps not at all, or contracts can be changed by legislative fiat. He thought this was a bad idea. He thought it disrupted what he called the relations between man and man. It made economic relations, economic engagements unstable, subject to either the will of one of the parties or the will of a party in the legislature. He thought it was very important that the Constitution had a contracts clause, which forbade the states from violating the obligation of contract. And as a judge, he worked to uphold the contracts clause. And this put him at odds in several important decisions with the Jeffersonian Party, the first Republican Party. So those were, I think, the three ways that Marshall was a lifelong Federalist. He wanted an effective federal government. He wanted the United States to have an independent foreign policy, not beholden to any of our allies. And he wanted the economic system to be guaranteed by comprehensible black and white laws and contracts and engagements and not subject to the whims of the political class. Marshall really did take the position that the United States needed a strong national government. I mean, it was something that he believed in throughout his lifetime. And yet John Adams tapped him to lead the Supreme Court in 1801. Would you tell us about the stature of the Supreme Court in 1801? Well, the Supreme Court had been up and running for 12 years. It had had three chief justices in that time. The first was John Jay, who was in there for six years. And John Jay was a considerable figure. He was an important diplomat. He'd been a spy master during the revolution, one of the authors of the Federalist Papers. He's a senior, important patriot. And this is the job he wanted. You know, George Washington said, what would you like to be? And Jay said, I'd like to be chief justice of the Supreme Court. So he gets it. There was a second man, John Rutledge, who was a recess appointment as chief justice. And then the Senate wouldn't confirm him. We've been going through the uh, Brett Kavanaugh nomination. Well, this was an early example of politics and Supreme Court nominations. This was a man who was already sitting as chief justice of the Supreme Court, a recess appointee, 
And when the Senate came back to the nation's capital, they didn't confirm the guy because he'd taken a position on a treaty that the majority in the Senate didn't like. So, you know, out he went. And then the third chief justice was a man named Oliver Ellsworth, also an important patriot, a considerable legal mind. So why didn't these guys stick around longer? I mean, apart from Rutledge, whom the Senate cast aside. Well, first of all, the job was onerous. Supreme Court justices had to also ride circuit in those days. They had to also serve as circuit judges. And this meant miles and miles of travel on lousy roads, staying in terrible inns, if you were lucky enough to get those. One Supreme Court justice on the Southern Circuit, he was in a carriage and his horse ran away with him and bucked him out and the wheel ran over his leg, you know, and he wrote to his wife and said, well, you know, it was just a minor wound and and I was able to get back on my feet the next day. Another justice tries to cross the Susquehanna River in the winter when it's frozen and he falls through, you know, and he has to be pulled out. It was just onerous, onerous work. The justices petitioned Congress to either be relieved of this responsibility or to somehow have their circuits shortened. The only thing Congress ultimately did is instead of having three huge circuits, they split each one in half. So there were six circuits and they assigned, you know, one justice per circuit rather than two justices to the huge circuit. So, you know, you still had to go from hither and yon, but it was a somewhat smaller territory you covered. The other thing was that the Supreme Court simply didn't bulk so large in the whole system. It made a couple of important decisions in the 1790s. One of them was almost immediately overturned by a constitutional amendment, the 11th Amendment, that was Chisholm v. Georgia, which said that citizens of other states cannot sue a state in federal court. The Constitution had said they could. The Supreme Court had ruled on such a suit. And then all the states said, oh, no, we don't like this. And this amendment passed in record time to block that as a way for people to sue states. But there was an air of triviality to the court. The decisions were given seriatim, which means that each justice would say one after another what his opinion was. They would read them out. There weren't, in other words, blocks of justices agreeing on an opinion. It was just, you know, one by one. And then after they all finished, you know, you looked at what they said and had to count it up and see which way the whole court went. And so John Jay leaves the job after six years. Ellsworth leaves it after five. He says he's got health problems. This is what he writes, President John Adams. And so John Adams, who has already lost his reelection to Thomas Jefferson, election of 1800, he's the lame duck. He has to appoint a new chief justice before Jefferson gets in because, of course, Jefferson will appoint a fellow Republican. So he nominates John Jay to come back, and John Jay is confirmed by the Senate. But then John Adams gets a letter from Jay saying, no, thank you. I don't want to come back to this job. And Jay says, it has no dignity. Could you imagine that today? Someone gets a nomination to be chief justice of the Supreme Court, is confirmed by the Senate, and then says, nah, you know, I think I'll stay in New York, you know, or Tennessee or wherever. Now, it's incomprehensible. But from Jay's point of view, I've been there. I did that. I didn't like it. I worked all the time and what effect did my decisions have? So no, I'm not going to go back. And as John Marshall tells the story, he's Adams' secretary of state, by this point, and he's in the newly constructed White House with the president. I mean, it's kind of like a construction site. The shell is up and they've got floors <laughs> that their chairs are sitting on, but it's a pretty uh, unfinished place. And Adams looks at Marshall and says, who shall I nominate now? Marshall doesn't know. He doesn't say anything. And then Adams says, I believe I'll nominate you. And so that's how John Marshall, who was only 45 years old at the time, got the nod. The Senate confirms him. He's sworn in a month before the old administration packs up and leaves. And then he stays for 34 years. So in the first 11, 12 years, you had three chief justices. Then for the next 34, you have one. 
And another change Marshall makes, I mean, aside from his own longevity, is the court begins to issue unanimous decisions. The justices don't give seriatim opinions. If they agree with an opinion of one of their brethren, they sign on to it. Now, this doesn't always happen. Sometimes a justice will give a concurring opinion. In other words, I agree with this conclusion. My reasoning is somewhat different. Here's what it is. Or occasionally they would dissent. I do not agree with this opinion. But in many, many cases, the Supreme Court starts to deliver unanimous opinions, in many of those cases written by the new Chief Justice John Marshall. So he's making the court something that is cohesive, something that has unity, something that speaks often with one voice. How did Marshall accomplish all of this? Because it sounds like he had this really huge task of trying to make the judicial branch co-equal with the other branches of government. And it may have taken him 34 years, but it sounds like he accomplished this task. Well, you know, he pulled it off more quickly than that. It was, you know, partly a combination of switching to these unanimous opinions wherever possible. How does he get that? One way he gets it is by deference. If one of his colleagues is more learned in a particular type of law than he is, he's happy to let that man take the lead. One subject that came up a lot was land titles in Kentucky. They were just a mess for various historical reasons. Land title law was not one of Marshall's specialties. He let other justices take the lead in those decisions. Admiralty law was another area where he would often either turn to a fellow justice for advice or let another justice write the opinion. So when he gives deference, he gets it in return. On cases where he wants to take the lead, he wants to write the decision, then his colleagues will defer to him. Second thing, everybody loves John Marshall, except for his second cousin, Thomas Jefferson, who hates him. But everybody else likes this guy. They like him because he's genial. He is good company. He has a great sense of humor. One of his colleagues, Justice Story, said, I love his laugh. Marshall also liked his drink. There was a custom of the Supreme Court before he got on it that the justices, when they met together to discuss their cases, now you have to understand that they are coming into the nation's capital. You know, first it's New York, then it's Philadelphia, and then ultimately it's Washington, D.C., They're only meeting there for one month a year, one month at a time. So they come in, they do a heavy load of work, they hear a lot of cases during the day, but then they go back to their boarding house where they're all rooming together and they have their dinner and they talk over the cases over dinner and then after dinner. And the custom before Marshall had been that they could only have wine at these discussions if it was raining outside. And I assume that was to cheer themselves up. So what Marshall would do, he'd always ask another justice, often Justice Story, Joseph Story, Brother Story, look out the window and tell us what the weather is. And Story would say, well, the sky is perfectly clear. And Marshall would say, our jurisdiction is so vast that by the law of chances, it must be raining somewhere. So wine was always served at the Marshall Court. You know, and this helps, makes people relax. It makes people feel that they're having a good time. And this is something Marshall could make his fellow justices feel. The third thing is he had a strength of mind that was very impressive. He's not what you would call a voluble man where it comes to his ideas or his opinions. He's kind of slow to get going. But once he bore down, there was something almost implacable about the quality of his reasoning. One of the lawyers who argued before him later became attorney general, William Wirt. He said, Marshall's mind is like the ocean. Everybody else's minds are like ponds. So this was just the kind of impression that Marshall's intellect made on his fellow justices. So you add this up, the deference, the geniality, the wine lubricating, and then just the power of this guy's mind. And this helps him convert 
all the justices that the Republican presidents appoint, right? Because when he comes on the court, you know, he's one of six justices. They're all Federalists. Every president has been up to that point a Federalist. All the justices they appointed were Federalists. But, you know, as time passes, uh, these guys get sick and retire or they die. Jefferson and then James Madison and then James Monroe, they appoint new justices. Well, Marshall, to the chagrin particularly of Thomas Jefferson, Marshall is able to convert these newcomers to his views and to convert them to follow his lead. So the court retains its character, its judicial profile, if you will, its political profile, thanks to Marshall's ability to woo his colleagues. You know, I asked you at the start of our conversation why you wrote a biography to answer a history question. But I think we're getting a good idea of how the life of one person can really help us get at the inner workings of an institution like the Supreme Court. Well, yes. And that was one of the fun things about this book, just to see how the sausages got made. I mean, one of Bob Woodward's many, many books some years ago was called The Brethren. He looked behind the curtain of the current Supreme Court. Well, a biography of John Marshall is the brethren for the Supreme Court, 1801 to 1835. Here he is. Here are his colleagues. Here's this cast of characters. You know, not all of them were easy men. I mean, some of them were proud. Some of them had good reason to be proud. Some of them were difficult. Some of them were prickly. One of the last justices that would come on at the end of his tenure was intermittently insane. Henry Baldwin, he would lose, you know, maybe a whole year because he was relaxing. In other words, he was off his rocker. And then he'd get it back together and he'd come back. But even when he was sane, he was extremely difficult and he disliked most of his colleagues, except for Marshall. So, you know, it wasn't always a bed of roses, but Marshall tried to make it as smooth and as agreeable and as unified as he possibly could. Now, before we start digging into the Marshall Court's most famous decisions, I'd like for us to explore one more idea or mindset that Marshall had. In your book, John Marshall, you state that Marshall believed that it was the Supreme Court that stood as the defender of both the Constitution and the people's rights. And I wonder if you would tell us how Marshall came to believe this and how he thought the Supreme Court would defend the Constitution and the people's rights. Well, he says this as early as the Virginia Ratifying Convention. This is when the Constitution is still up in the air and it's being debated. And the debates in Virginia were particularly intense. It was a very evenly divided state. It was also a must-have state. It was the largest state in the country by a big margin and an eminent state, considering the patriots that came out of it. So young John Marshall is one of the delegates, and he gives a speech on the judiciary. There had been worries expressed in the convention that how can we have a federal judiciary that might overawe our own state judiciary? How could we trust it? And Marshall says, you will rely on the independence of those judges in the same way that you rely on the independence of the judges of Virginia. You put judges in you give them tenure for good behavior to remove them from political influence, and therefore you rely on the impartiality of these men to make just decisions on the cases that come before them. And that's true of our state judges, and that will be true of our federal judges. And if the other branches of the federal government should go off the rails, if they should do something that's contrary to the Constitution or contrary to the rights of the people, if it comes to court, the judiciary will rein them in. So he's expressing the concept of judicial review before the Constitution is even ratified. And actually, judicial review was not such an out there notion. He was by no means alone in this. Alexander Hamilton said the same thing in one of the Federalist Papers. Judicial review was an idea whose time had come. It was out there. It was already in the minds, especially of legally oriented Americans. Now, where it becomes very contentious during Marshall's time on the Supreme Court is what power will the federal courts have over the decision of state courts? 
And there are a lot of people at the state level, particularly in Virginia, but not only in Virginia, who are fine with judicial review in state courts, but do not at all want federal courts to have more than the most minimal jurisdiction over state decisions. And this is a very contentious point, and Marshall will rule in several cases that the federal government does have this power. It also seemed to be a very contentious view with Thomas Jefferson. Well, Jefferson is a small D Democrat. I'm not using that as a partisan designation, but Jefferson believes in the rule of the people. He has great faith in the average person as a voter and as a political actor. And, you know, he says over and over again that when the people elect their representatives and those representatives pass laws which carry out the people's will, we can trust this process. We can trust ordinary people. And so he's very suspicious of courts acting as breaks on this process or having a say over the laws that are passed. And this is a lifelong concern of his. I think he would have had it even if John Marshall had never existed. You know, if you take his personal dislike for Marshall out of the equation, Jefferson would still have had these reservations. He never comes up with a satisfactory solution to the problem. I mean, he toys with various notions of how the Supreme Court itself might be checked. Maybe we want ongoing conventions like the Philadelphia Convention that wrote the Constitution. Maybe that's what we need every time a constitutional issue comes before the court. The final word should not be in the court, but that there should be a constitutional convention to resolve it. And his friend and ally, James Madison, points out to him this would be very costly and very onerous and very clumsy. So Jefferson drops that idea, but he is never happy with the notion of judges unelected serving for good behavior, you know, for life if they behave well, having the final word. Turning back now to this question of should the federal courts have supremacy over state courts? One of the really big decisions the Marshall Court made on this question was in the 1818 case McCullough versus Maryland. Richard, would you tell us about this case? Specifically, Matthew would like to know how Marshall expanded federal powers in this case and then justified their expansion in his decision. McCullough v. Maryland, there are two parts to the decision. The case involved the Second Bank of the United States, which was a kind of forerunner of the Federal Reserve, although there's no direct connection. Alexander Hamilton had wanted a Bank of the United States. The first bank existed for 20 years, 1791 to 1811. Then after the War of 1812, a second Bank of the United States was chartered for another 20 years. And the case McCullough v. Maryland had to do with could a state tax a branch of the Second Bank of the United States that existed within its borders? So the Second Bank of the United States had branches scattered throughout the country. One of them was in Baltimore. And a number of states had laws that imposed taxes on the Bank of the United States branches. Some of these were punitive taxes. They were designed to force these branches out. Ohio, Kentucky had huge taxes that would be levied on out-of-state banks, you know, $20,000, which in those days was, you had to close your doors. It was too big a sum to pay. Maryland had a tax of $5,000, which was comparable to the taxes that it levied on state banks. It was a revenue-raising measure. So the Second Bank of the United States does not want to have to pay a tax to the state of Maryland to operate within its borders. And the case was basically an arranged case. A clerk at the Second Bank named McCullough paid out a note to one of the directors. The bank had not paid Maryland's tax. And so he was brought to state court in Maryland. He appealed. Then it finally came before the Supreme Court. So there were two questions. Was the Bank of the United States, the first or the second, constitutional? And then a second question is, 
can a federal court rule on this matter? So as to the first question, the constitutionality of the bank, Marshall basically repeats Alexander Hamilton's argument to George Washington in 1791 when Hamilton has first proposed that there be a first bank of the United States. And Thomas Jefferson and James Madison are telling President Washington, no, we can't do this because it is not an enumerated power in the Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution that gives the federal government the power to set up a bank of this kind. Hamilton says, well, fine, but the Constitution does give the federal government certain powers, raising army and navies, regulating commerce, handling its own funds. And it would be more convenient to do all of these things if there was a Bank of the United States. And there is no prohibition of this. The Constitution does not say that you can't do this. So if the purpose to be served is constitutional, and if there is no prohibition on serving it in this manner, then it must be constitutional to realize the purpose. This is the argument Hamilton makes, and Marshall buys it in this decision. And then in terms of the federal government overruling you know, the courts of Maryland in this matter, Marshall takes the position that he's taken before and that he has taken again, that the system is designed to allow appeals on specified matters to come before the federal courts. And the Bank of the United States is part of the federal government. Its clerk is being sued by a state. And so this is a matter that the Constitution says federal courts can take cognizance of. Now, the other thing I want to say about McCullough versus Maryland is one paragraph in it, which really had legs. It's probably the most eloquent thing John Marshall wrote. He's talking about the government of the Union. The government of the Union is emphatically and truly a government of the people. In form and in substance, it emanates from them. Its powers are granted by them and are to be exercised directly on them and for their benefit. Okay, so what does this paragraph sound like? Well, look at those prepositions, of the people, from them, by them, on them, for their benefit. This structure of prepositions is going to be picked up by Daniel Webster when he makes his second reply to Senator Hayne in 1830, and it's going to be picked up in 1863 by Abraham Lincoln when he delivers the Gettysburg Address, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. So Marshall is giving here, he's planting a rhetorical seed, which will finally grow in the Gettysburg Address. The intellectual point here is that the government of the United States is not the result of a treaty among the states. It was created by the people. It was ratified not by the state legislatures. It was ratified by conventions of the people so that it would be an act of the people of the United States. Now, people who believed in a compact theory of the federal government, that all it is is a compact among the states, they would say, well, but these conventions met in the states. You know, there was a convention in Virginia, there was one in Delaware, there's one in New Hampshire. Marshall's answer to that was, well, yeah, they met in the states. Where else would you have had them meet? Would you have had everybody go to Philadelphia all at once. No, you had to split it up. So they did meet state by state, but they were conventions of the people because this was a government from the people, not from the states. The people of each state express their own will in their state governments, but the people of all of America expressed their will in forming this constitution. So the Constitution of the United States is not a state's document. It is a people's document. And he expresses that, I think, most eloquently in this decision, McCullough v. Maryland. Now, I know we're not in the time warp yet, but after we take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor, I do have a counterfactual or hypothetical question to ask. Written records are crucial to any historian's understanding. And as a diplomat, cabinet member, and chief justice, John Marshall left us more records than most people, 
placing these documents in the context of their time, the issues, arguments, rivalries, and allegiances of the day, and in the context of a person's life, their education, upbringing, and personal relationships, is a historian's job. But there's always more for us to learn. That's why groups dedicated to the study of one individual can be so helpful to historians and to us, fellow travelers in early American history. The John Marshall Foundation is one such organization. It helps everyone learn more about the contributions of the singular individual. The John Marshall Foundation was established in 1987 by a group of dedicated lawyers, the Virginia Bar Association, and the Association for the Preservation of Virginia Antiquities in order to steward the legacy of the great Chief Justice. Since then, the John Marshall Foundation has assembled an impressive portfolio of tools for classroom teachers, students, and for people like us who just want to learn more about Marshall. So go to their website and check it out, johnmarshallfoundation.org, and you'll find all their videos, suggested readings, and many more resources the Foundation has posted for free. Plus, in addition to all their awesome resources, the John Marshall Foundation also sponsors lectures and events. In fact, on November 12, 2018, They'll host today's guest, Richard Brookheiser, at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture in Richmond. That's right. You can see and hear Richard Brookheiser in person on November 12, 2018. Richard will be at the museum to discuss his new biography, John Marshall, The Man Who Made the Supreme Court. And his lecture will be part of the Virginia Museum of History and Culture's Banner Lecture Series. The lecture starts at 5.30 p.m. in the Robbins Family Forum. Now, I've placed details for this lecture in the show notes. And if you do go to Richard's talk at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture, be sure you mention the John Marshall Foundation and Ben Franklin's World, because they'll let you in for free. Okay, so I have a pre-time or hypothetical question to ask. When I heard you describe the McCullough v. Maryland case through Marshall's legal reasoning, I thought, okay, this makes sense. We know Marshall's politics. I get why this decision was made. And now I wonder... How do you think our understanding of this case would be different if we tried to look at it through just the legal decision and without any prior knowledge of Marshall's politics? I mean, what happens to our understanding of this when we take Marshall's biography out of this decision? Well, you know, I don't think it would change it much because Marshall is never terse. You know, he explains himself pretty thoroughly in these major constitutional decisions. They're not short. They're like 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 words. His decision on the law of treason in the trial of Aaron Burr, that's like 25,000 words. That's immense. But most of his big constitutional decisions are very thoroughly laid out, very thoroughly argued. I mean, you might disagree with it, but nothing is going to be hidden from you, right? He really does lay it all out. This, I think, is what William Wirt Part of what he meant when he said Marshall's mind was like an ocean rather than a pond. He is concerned to give you the big picture in his decisions. Now, I wonder if we could explore one more of the Marshall Court's important landmark decisions. To go back to your point that Marshall believed that the government needed to support contracts, would you tell us about the 1819 case, Dartmouth College v. Woodward? What decision was made in that case? Yes, well, Dartmouth College was an old institution. It preceded the revolution. It had gotten a charter from George III, and its founder was a man named Eliezer Wheelock, and he started off wanting to educate American Indians, to convert them to Christianity and to educate them. And then he raised money in England for a second institution, which would also continue to educate Indians or Native Americans, but would be mostly for white students in New Hampshire, where it was finally founded. And this was Dartmouth. It was named after the Earl of Dartmouth, who was one of his big donors. So Wheelock dies. He's succeeded by his son. And Dartmouth's charter, its governing structure, said that there would be a board of trustees and that they would have the power to pick the president and their replacements, you know, as they retired or died. The trustees would pick the new trustees. And so Dartmouth went along from year to year. One of its most famous graduates was young Daniel Webster, who would go on to have quite a career indeed. But Dartmouth had been founded as a religious institution. It was a Calvinist school, Congregationalist or Presbyterian. As the first two-party system developed, it was also a very Federalist school. It was very, let's say, stick in the mud. 
That's just what it was. So the political climate in New Hampshire changes a bit. By the mid-18-teens, they have a Republican legislature, a, you know, a Jeffersonian legislature. They've got a Republican governor, a man named William Plumer. The legislature passes, and he signs a bill that we're going to change Dartmouth. We're going to call it Dartmouth University. We are going to expand the board of trustees, and we're going to put a board of overseers over the board of trustees, and all these new people will be appointed by the state. And Plumer makes clear that he's going to open up Dartmouth. You know, he'll still appoint some Federalists, sure, that's fine. But he also wants to appoint good Republicans. He wants to diversify the intellectual climate of Dartmouth. And why do this? Well, because education is very important, and it's important for the young men of Dartmouth to be exposed to a variety of ideas. So this is what the new Dartmouth University will be. Well, the old order, the old faculty, they hate this. They move to a new building sort of down the street in Hanover, New Hampshire, and then they sue Mr. Woodward, who he was the treasurer of the old college, but he went along with the change. So he's now the treasurer of the new university, and they sue him for the seal of the college and various you know, important documents that he has in his possession. So this becomes a case in court, and the case comes up to the Supreme Court. So the decision in Dartmouth v. Woodward, and this is not a unanimous decision, and that's partly because it was decided at the very beginning of a term. They'd heard the arguments in the preceding term, and then, you know, months passed before they met again. There was a certain amount of jockeying among the justices, and then Marshall announces at the very beginning of the new term, okay, here's my decision, and by the way, a majority of the justices agrees with me. So that was a little, you know, a little politicking was going on there, more out in the open than it often was. So his decision was, the original charter of Dartmouth was a contract. That was a contract that the trustees entered into among themselves. And it was ratified by the King of England, who ruled the colony of New Hampshire at the time. And these are the terms under which Dartmouth operates. And the state simply cannot come along and change this contract. That is what this new law does. They are interfering with Dartmouth, with the way they want to run their own institution according to their charter, which is a contract. So Marshall is bringing the contract clause to bear on this question. And, you know, he says, of course, education is important. Everybody admits that. But does that mean that every teacher is an employee of the state government? Every teacher anywhere? No, it can't be. This is giving the state government too much power. And by the way, we have a contract clause in our Constitution, and the state of New Hampshire is violating this. So he rules for Dartmouth, meaning Dartmouth College, the old regime, rules against Woodward, who is the employee of the new regime. He upholds the old Dartmouth charter, and so Dartmouth could go back to its old ways. Now, you know, of course, Dartmouth itself changes over time, but it changes because it wants to change, not because the state comes in and says, we don't like the way you're doing it, so we're going to change your rules. Marshall says to the state, no, you can't do that. They picked their own rules themselves. This is their own arrangement. This is their contract. You have no rights to interfere with that. Our purpose in exploring the life of John Marshall has really been to explore biography as a genre. And somehow, while serving as Chief Justice, John Marshall found time to write a biography, a biography of George Washington. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about Marshall the biographer. So, Richard, what kind of biographer was John Marshall? And would you tell us about his biography of Washington? Well, it's too long. I have read it. I've read every volume. It's a little dry. John Adams compared it to like an immense monument block of stone, you know, even though he liked Marshall, he stuck him on the Supreme Court, but he didn't like the Washington biography. Parson Weems did a much more dramatic one. You know, even though some of the stories of Washington's childhood that Weems told, we now think Weems made up, but he was much better at shaping the life and giving it in a much handier form. 
Now, the Marshall biography was a success in its day. It, you know, it sold pretty well, even though it was expensive, made a nice return for the author. I would say the best parts of it are parts of his description of the revolution. There, he's really writing from his own firsthand experience. He follows the movements of troops and describes the battles. He describes them well. He really captures the kind of chaos and deprivation that the troops often lived under because they were not being adequately supported by the Continental Congress. So those parts are good. He also, his descriptions of some of the clashes between Hamilton and Jefferson early in the Washington administration are surprisingly fair, considering his own federalism and his own detestation of Thomas Jefferson. When he talks about the First Bank of the United States, he really lets each of them have their say. It's only when he gets into foreign policy that he starts drawing the demon horns on Jefferson's head and says, ah, this guy was a French patriot. (laughs) There he goes a little overboard. Do we know why Marshall chose to write a biography of Washington? He adored him. He was that superior man. He was the greatest man on earth. You know, I have to say it again. When Marshall saw this guy in action, he just thought, this is the man. This is it. He is the one who's carrying this revolution on his shoulders. I am proud to be serving him, and I will do this for the rest of my life, which he does 36 years after Washington is dead. Now, when we started our conversation, we noted that you wrote your biography, John Marshall, to try and get an answer to your question of whether the Supreme Court should be the sole arbiter of constitutional questions. Now that you've finished your biography, did you find an answer to your question? Well, if it comes as a case, the Supreme Court is the end of the line. Now, do we think the Supreme Court is doing its job well these days? There's a lot of reason to think not. Okay, so how do you get them to do their job better? The only practical way that I can see is to make it a matter of legal education to approach the Constitution in the way that the Constitution meant itself to be approached. And this also includes all the amendments to it, the Civil War amendments, the 20th century amendments, but to try and understand why it's there, what it means, what it's trying to accomplish, what it's trying to forestall, and to rule on that basis. And then this also places responsibility on us, the people, because if we really don't like the direction of these rulings, the Constitution allows us to change it. The Constitution gives rules for amending it. And there have been over 20 amendments over the years. There can be more. There can be constitutional conventions if you go through the process, assemble the votes. So the Constitution is not fixed in unalterable stone. You know, maybe in stone, but the stone can be changed under certain circumstances. But the judges that we have there at the end of the line of interpreting it, and if we don't like that end of the line, we can draw a new line according to the Constitution itself. That would be my final conclusion after having marched through John Marshall's life, and I think he himself would agree with it. Okay, let's move into the time warp. This is the fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, what might have happened if John Jay had agreed to President John Adams' request that he return as Chief Justice to the Supreme Court. What would have happened to the Supreme Court and to the development of the judicial branch if Marshall had not served as Chief Justice? Well, I think John Jay certainly would not have gone on 34 more years. He was an older man than John Marshall. Clearly, the fact that he refused the chance to go back indicates some antsiness on his part. So even if he had agreed to John Adams's appeals and taken the job a second time, probably would not have been for long. So I imagine the court then would have, you know, there would have been a kind of period of continued turbulence. 
Jay's successor would have been nominated by Thomas Jefferson or perhaps James Madison. So you would have had a Republican chief justice early on. Interesting. I think I'll just leave it at that. It might have taken a long while for the court to have settled into the role of importance that Marshall gave it. So, Richard, you've written many biographies. Are you writing another? Is there another Federalist who intrigues you? My next book is going to be called It's a Free Country, and it's going to be an argument on the nature of American nationalism, which I assert is unique because of its concern for liberty. And I'm going to look at 12 episodes and instances of that from colonial times to the late 20th century. And if we have questions about John Marshall or your new project, how can we contact you? Well, I have a website and there is a way to contact me through that. It's richardbrookheiser.com. I'm also on Twitter. My handle is rbrookheiser. Those two ways should do it. Richard Brookheiser, thank you so much for joining us again and for helping us better understand the life of John Marshall and biography. Thank you for having me. The government of the Union, then, whatever may be the influence of this fact on the case, is emphatically and truly a government of the people. In form and in substance, it emanates from them. Its powers are granted by them and are to be exercised directly on them and for their benefit. This government is acknowledged by all to be one of enumerated powers. The principle that it can exercise only the powers granted to it would seem too apparent to have required to be enforced by all those arguments which its enlightened friends, while it was depending before the people, found it necessary to urge. That principle is now universally admitted. But the question respecting the extent of the powers actually granted is perpetually arising and will probably continue to arise as long as our system shall exist. The government of the United States, then, though limited in its powers, is supreme, and its laws, when made in pursuance of the Constitution, form the supreme law of the land. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. Richard likes biography for many of the same reasons that we enjoy biography. Biographies are about people. We enjoy learning about the lives of others because they help us see how other people lived, how they solved problems, and how similar and different they were from us. Richard also likes biography because he believes the lives of people can help us find answers to larger historical questions. Questions such as, should the Supreme Court be the sole arbiter of constitutional questions? A biography may not solve or resolve big questions like this one, but they can be helpful as we search for answers because people from the past ask themselves the same or similar questions. For example, John Marshall believed that the answer to that question was yes, but why? This is what Richard explored in his biography, John Marshall, The Man Who Made the Supreme Court. By exploring the life of Marshall, Richard was able to see how and why Marshall exercised and expanded the powers of the Supreme Court the way he did, and where he saw the place of the Supreme Court within the American system of government. As the fourth Chief Justice in 12 years, and as the Chief Justice who would preside over the court for 34 years, Marshall had the opportunity to shape the Supreme Court to conform with the views he expressed about the judiciary at the Virginia Ratifying Convention in 1788. But how did he develop his views that the United States should have a strong, powerful, independent judicial branch? It was interesting to hear Richard describe the development of Marshall's political views in a very similar way to how Joel Richard Paul described them in episode 210. The ground floor layer of Marshall's politics was set during his military service in the Revolution. Marshall served in the military as a junior officer between 1775 and 1781. During that time, he witnessed the suffering of the army because of what he saw as a weak and disorganized national government. Marshall wanted better for the new nation. He wanted a strong national government that would stand strong in the world. He also wanted a government that honored its debt and contractual obligations and offered a legal structure for individual Americans to do the same. Marshall made his case for such a government while convincing his fellow delegates at the Virginia Ratifying Convention to vote yes on the Constitution. He also helped the new government evolve into the government he foresaw and wanted, with his service as a diplomat, Secretary of State, and as Chief Justice, where Marshall made it clear that the Supreme Court 
was in fact the sole arbiter of constitutional questions. Now, if we don't like this fact, well, as Richard said, Marshall gave us the language we need to change the system in his majority opinions in cases like McCullough versus Maryland. This is where he said that the government of the United States is of the people and by the people. The Constitution and the government it created was an act of the people. And as the people, the Constitution empowers us to change it. We can amend the Constitution to fix any part of the system that we don't think works for us, just as Americans in the early United States did with their first 12 amendments. When the elections of 1796 and 1800 proved problematic, because the losing presidential candidate received the post of vice president, and a presumptive vice presidential candidate challenged the presumptive presidential candidate for the presidency, Americans amended the Constitution to establish a clearer system for electing their president and vice president. In 1803, they proposed the 12th Amendment, and they ratified it in 1804. Now, over the last two episodes, we've been able to see not just different aspects of John Marshall's life, but how two different biographers use John Marshall's life to find answers to different questions. Both Joel Richard Paul and Richard Brookheiser see John Marshall as having had a huge impact on the development of the Supreme Court. Both see Marshall as having shaped the court and the judicial branch into the powerful body and co-equal branch of government that we know them as today. But Joel Richard Paul explored the life of John Marshall to better understand the forces, people, and events that shaped him. Paul's goals were to discover how Marshall came to have such an impact on the legal history of the United States and to entice and invite readers to explore that history. To fulfill these goals, Paul wrote a 512-page biography that goes into many of the details of Marshall's early life. His boyhood, service in the Revolution, his legal training in early days as a politician, his service as a diplomat serving in the XYZ affair, and in the way that those forces shaped his judicial opinions. Richard Brookheiser wrote a different, shorter biography of 336 pages. Rather than detail Marshall's early and personal life, Richard summarized it to give us a context we need to better understand why Marshall makes such a good figure for us to explore his historical question of whether the Supreme Court should have the final say on constitutional questions. Now, just as our guest scholars related in episode 209, biographers' goals are important. Goals shape biographies. And over the last two episodes, we've been able to hear how two biographers use the life of the same figure to accomplish different goals, and how those goals shape the ways that they researched and wrote their biographies of John Marshall. The government of the United States, then, though limited in its powers, is supreme, and its laws, when made in pursuance of the Constitution, form the supreme law of the land. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary, notwithstanding. But if the full application of this argument could be admitted, it might bring into question the right of Congress to tax the state banks, and could not prove the right of the states to tax the Bank of the United States. The court has bestowed on this subject its most deliberate consideration. The result is a conviction that the states have no power, by taxation or otherwise, to retard, impede, burden, or in any manner control the operations of the constitutional laws enacted by Congress to carry into execution the powers vested in the general government. This is, we think, the unavoidable consequence of that supremacy, which the Constitution has declared. We are unanimously of opinion that the law passed by the legislature of Maryland imposing a tax on the Bank of the United States is unconstitutional and void. Look for more information about Richard, his book John Marshall, plus notes for everything we talked about today on the show notes page. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash 211. This episode marks the third episode in the Omohundro Institute's four-episode Doing History series on biography. If you're just joining us, be sure you go back and listen to episodes 209 and 210 so that you can discover more about biography as a genre and so you can get a fuller picture of the life and deeds of John Marshall. You should also be sure to download next week's episode, episode 212, which will conclude this series with a conversation with Erica Dunbar. Erica will help us better understand how biographers research the lives of the people they write about by taking us through the life of Ona Judge, George and Martha Washington's escaped slave, and how Erica went about uncovering and retelling Ona's story in her biography, Never Caught. Now, if you can't wait until next week because you'd just like to take your exploration of biography further right now, 
You should check out the great resources my Omohundro Institute Digital Projects team teammates, Joseph Edelman, Holly White, and Kim Foley, have placed in the OI Reader app. The app is free and can be downloaded on any iOS or Android device. For more details, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash OI Reader. Just a reminder that thanks in part to the John Marshall Foundation, Richard Brookheiser will be speaking about John Marshall at the Virginia Museum of History and Culture in Richmond on Monday, November 12 at 5.30 p.m. If you attend, be sure to tell them that you know all about the John Marshall Foundation and Ben Franklin's world, because doing so will get you a free ticket to Richard's talk. Throughout today's episode, you heard Joel Sharpton, the proprietor of Pro Podcasting Services and the host of the personal storytelling podcast, What Makes Me Weird, play the part of John Marshall. You heard Joel read excerpts of Marshall's majority opinion in McCullough vs. Maryland. I've included links for Joel and his podcast in the show notes. Finally, Now that you've heard a lot about biography, do you think a biography of a person's life is a good way to get at the answer to a historical question? I'm curious, so let me know. Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of the Omohundro Institute. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.